What is it? What do we normally say, everyone? I'll just say something, and we'll redo it if we need to. Hey, everyone. I'm Kevin Hardy here with Jordan Rocha. Welcome back to Monroe Live. And today we're going to talk about the F-150 body in white. Um, we're not going to talk about the bed, just mostly the cab, because all the manufacturing strategies and things that Ford is doing is, is present within the cab um, and in the bed as well. But there's more unique things within the cab itself. So if we kind of come around to the front here, um, you'll see essentially the, uh, the FESM module here itself. It's an overmolded steel piece. The ICE vehicle has a magnesium uh, a piece that runs straight across that supports the headlights itself. So that is a change that is BEV specific. You might even see it here on the, the label itself. And um, not only is this BEV specific, Kevin, to me, this is you know, when you actually pull off the skin, you get the face off, you get the front out. This is one of the biggest advantages in the marketplace. Oh, absolutely. This is the enabler for one of the biggest, in, you know, advantages that this vehicle has over all of its competitors. Like, this is the secret sauce that gives them a giant front open. Yep. It'll be interesting to see. I know people have made comments, essentially, not that it looks too much like the regular F-150, but you know, when you look at the, the other FESM aspects or the load beams here, um, FESM is front end structural module. You know, this is directly carryover from the ICE truck. So everything coming through here, everything you're seeing in white and kind of a gray color is essentially common with the, the ICE truck itself. You can see the trans tunnel, there's access compartments there um, that are present on the regular vehicle as well for um, transfer case considerations um, on four wheel drive vehicles. But that's one of the things that uh, essentially allowed Ford to get this into production so quickly because it, it does have a lot of carryover and already validated components and essentially gives it a, uh, a traditional and kind of conventional appearance to its market or its buyers, which is the largest in the industry. They produce roughly, depending on the year with COVID and some other stuff like that, almost 700,000 F-Series trucks a year and by far are one of the highest volume vehicles in the country itself. So um, as we kind of come through here, as Jordan mentioned, this is the enabler. It'll be interesting to see on maybe a BEV specific version, a uh, second iteration of the Lightning, if they're able to get this load for even lower um, with this cross car beam here, because essentially these fastening points here are going down to the frame shoehorns on the vehicle itself. But there is uh, potentially some more room to get that shelf even lower um, and help loading and making the, the front more usable and maybe in a future iteration, maybe a smaller frontal area of the grill uh, coming down the line. So this is a, an extruded aluminum piece here, which is flow drill screwed and adhesively bonded to this hydroform piece here. Uh, maybe, I know you I should, maybe you should talk a little bit about just real quick what flow drilling is. Cause sure, yeah. for those of you who don't know, it's pretty cool. So maybe just tell them a little bit how so that you works. Can, if you want to come around here, you can actually see through right here. So essentially there's a, there's a head, there's, there's different types of feeding mechanisms. Typically it's almost like a machine gun. You have these screws on a belt as they come in and then it'll use, you know, heat and friction and push these, um, these screws in and it'll essentially uh, cut threads and bond each piece together. And the kind of cool thing about this is this is serviceable. These can be removed and put back in from a repairability or rework perspective if you needed to. So that is one of the kind of cool aspects of this, this uh, fastening technology itself. And then on the other side, you can see the self-piercing rivets and the difference between them. Yeah, the ability to through. go single-sided access and then not care so much about the material thicknesses on the two panels really is a, a huge advantage of using the flow drills, especially in aluminum, right? I think if you were to look at a lot of the JLR, Jaguar Land Rover applications, the Audi A8, uh, the Jaguar um, uh, I-Pace and all of its predecessors, a lot of the Land Rover vehicles, where they're joining aluminum, they did a lot of this. And um, with the relationship that Ford used to have with Jaguar Land Rover, it would seem that they garnered a lot of um, experience and, and insight as to how to do these things. So, um, and obviously, again, for those of you who don't know, an aluminum cab on this truck is a huge leg up that, um, you know, GM and, and FCA or Stellantis have yet to do. Yeah, anything in a full-size segment. So the Toyotas and the Titan, or the Nissans as well. Yep. 
But these are, it's an interesting, enab interesting enabler because they're kind of, um, I'd consider them a little bit more of a permanent fastener um, with respect to maybe bolts or some of the other things that you'll see in some of the Teslas where they're bolting castings and other structural monuments together. And then as you kind of come across here in the cow, you'll see um, this cow is actually brought together uh, with a process called toggle locking, which essentially is almost swaging these two panels together. And if you come around the front, you'll see a good, good view of it, which is very cool because you can also join dissimilar materials, different laminates um, with this strategy. It's, uh, and there's no separate fastener, right? Nope. So, so it's, it's just, just, it's pure tooling, right? So there's no, here you've got a piece. There's, a, there's an object that goes through the two panels to secure them together. Here, it's pure tooling operation. So there's no consumable, as it were. It's cool. It's, uh, it's, if you have the space and you can use it, it's a good strategy to go with. So you have these kind of underslung brackets here. So these are present on the ICE vehicle as well. There's a material change, uh, I believe, on these. You can see some of the e-coat. And then um, what used to be present uh, for supporting the front, there's some fasteners here. And there's a steel beam that runs across. But um, what I love about this is, is the, is the hydroform, you know, FESM upper load beam. So essentially you have no weld flanges, no extra material. You can kind of tailor the thickness a little bit. Uh, it is a, you wouldn't do it so much with this particular component, but essentially you pre-bend the material itself, load it in the tool, they'll shoot it, it'll expand. You can pierce a lot of these things out um, without doing any secondary operations. And it's, it's pretty elegant as far as the manufacturing process is concerned. And then as we kind of move rearward, um, you can't see it, but if we were to peel back, and maybe we will later, there's actually a hydroforming um, member that runs from the A-pillar up into the roof bay, roof bow, excuse me, all the way back. And with essentially Ford building three different variations of the cab on the ice configuration, not so much on the Lightning, where you can get a, the Super Crew, which is what we see here, the extended cab, which is a Super Cab, and then a regular cab, which I think is the, I think the only ones that are actually building a modern regular cab pickup. Everyone else is doing legacy uh, pickups based off a of previous generation. You just short load the tool itself. So this pipe will go in and then they just feed it with a, a uh, shorter material for whatever cab configuration. No additional tooling, it's just kind of an insert in the tool. Uh, so again, from a tooling perspective, you can amortize those costs over a very, very high volume. And this is one of the highest volume vehicles produced in North America. So it's pretty impressive. One of the things that really stands out to me especially after having driven it, um, is the lack of major NVH changes, right? In many cases, when you've got an ICE platform that's adapting to a BEV application, or in many cases, even a PHEV, right? So a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, there's a lot of additional NVH treatments and pads and different things, stuffers that you'll find as you start to peel apart the vehicle. And on this, there was very little in the way of additional NVH treatment um, past what was locally applied to the high voltage components themselves. So, of course, they had a NVH pad around the drive and the motor units, uh, around the EAC compressor, right? Some of those noise producers. However, the NVH treatment to the body in isolation to the cabin is relatively carryover. And so, to me, that says, uh, one, if you don't need to use it, great job, because that's cost avoidance for F-150. And two, it probably speaks to the fact that the base vehicle, ICE or BEV, is performing quite well from an NVH perspective. Yeah, and I'm sure they had some hurdles to, to get through with switching to aluminum. Oh, so yeah. there's, uh, you know, kind of the tinginess factor during range. It's all, there's a whole sort of, you know, slew of considerations when they did the material change over um, to aluminum. And, you know, the... Vehicles have been built in aluminum before. You mentioned JLR. They've been, since World War II, essentially building aluminum body vehicles. It, what makes Ford unique in that regard is just simply the fact that they committed with their highest volume, highest profit margin product first. And then sure. you're seeing that, that was, you know, in 2015, uh, kind of, you know, staking the company. And you're seeing it again, kind of with, again, the F-Series truck leading the way for how the company may go forward. Um, as we kind of come around to the, the inside of the cabin itself, so the... This isn't all aluminum. Actually, this, the 
the, the dash panel itself is quiet steel. And again, you'll see there some toggle lockings being used to join those two dissimilar materials. This is a very early build vehicle. So, uh, you know, I, when you look at some of the, the ceiling uh, being hand applied, it'd be interesting to see if that changes on later versions or it's a little bit neater. I feel compelled to say something because I criticize a Tesla. So, but as you kind of pull back, what's kind of cool about the quad steel is essentially it's two layers of steel with a laminate in between it. So that is aside from like safety restraint points, you know, in the floors and those reinforcement for restraints and other safety stuff, that's pretty much the only aluminum that is in this, excuse me, only steel that's in this vehicle. This video is sponsored by Ariat. Hey boys and girls, um, I'd like to thank the uh, folks at Ariat for um, supplying my uh, head to toe outfit here today. I'm using their boots, the jeans that they gave me, and I'm this wonderful shirt. I'm really, really happy with all this stuff. If you um, are like me and, um, and you like well-made clothes, I'd highly recommend you click the, uh, the little uh, tag below and you can get a discount and uh, and you can get some wonderful, wonderful clothing from Ariat. Thanks a lot. Save 10% off your first order by clicking the link in the description below. Now, as we kind of you know, come back, aside from that, what you're seeing is, is primarily just a series of stampings being used to join this vehicle together. They're using self-piercing rivets where they do have two-sided access, where they don't, as Jordan mentioned, there's uh, flow drill screws and some to toggle locking being used throughout. But in a short, you know, because of the scale of this vehicle and its volume consideration, there's almost, you know, I don't want to say no other reason to use stampings, but it, you'll see that that is a key indication of essentially vehicles that are produced at um, a very high volume is strategies that are conducive to being produced as such. And I want to go back to the cow, but you can kind of see it here. If you want to bring the camera around, you'll see essentially a snap fit tab midway up this D pillar, excuse me, C pillar. So what's actually in here, and I'll show you a better example of it, is a, that's a, a like an MVH and uh, baffle itself. So it's injection molded, and then it has a heat activated foam sealer. And I'll show you what it actually kind of looks like when it activates up here, because we skip past it. So you see some of it coming out here, but if you look inside the actual cow, coming around, there you'll see the baffle. So it's pretty interesting. It is a like a higher cost consideration, but they're using an injection molded piece. It's shaped, it's contoured, and then essentially it allows that sealer to get exactly where they want it to go and have pretty good control over it. Um, we have seen with some of the trucks in the past, specifically this scene here where some of the, um, the sealer they're using to, to block out this air path would actually not adhere properly. So they have taken some measures specifically on this vehicle being an EV to ensure that it performs good in overall kind of NVH considerations. But the, the biggest thing in general with this vehicle is, is the aluminum aspect and the weight savings. So not only does it allow you to get in certain test weight classes, which is very important on the ice side, you know, for emissions, um, it gives you that flexibility to either offer your customers, you know, a lightweight vehicle, more range, or in terms of like higher end products on the Lincoln side of the house, you can sell essentially content back and then make profit because they could put more um, customer centric features in the vehicle because they saved um, for the previous generation and a comparable trim level, almost 700 pounds uh, going to aluminum. So it's, it's been pretty interesting, the overall switch. Yeah. And the other thing is, is if the curb weight of your vehicle, meaning nothing else in the vehicle, just how much the vehicle weighs on the, on the dealership lot. Like if you go and see it completely empty, um, if that is lower, but the springs, the chassis, the suspension can hold, you know, the same amount of total weight, that means that the delta between, or the difference between the curb weight and the GVWR, which is the gross vehicle weight rating, how much it can totally carry, what you end up getting is more weight carrying capability to the customer, right? So that can translate into towing in some cases, but certainly payload and, and overall 
um, load carrying capability. So making this lighter makes it so that you can carry heavy stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And that's a key aspect in this segment in general. Maybe not so much with the Lightning specifically, but on its ice counterparts, specifically on the Super Duty side of the house, which is using a very similar cab. Uh, every pound saved is essentially something in the future they can put towards towing capacity, which is important yeah. um, for that, that vehicle segment. But you know, overall, um, it is a, what I would consider like a relatively conventional body structure. Um, there's nothing overly exotic about it besides the fact that they took the plunge with the material and the, the actual product itself. Um, but overall, it's proved, I think, beneficial for them. They have a very, very low center of gravity, you know, for yep. both their ice trucks and now the, the Lightning itself. And as you may know, there's a sizable delta in weight between this and the, and the Rivian itself, which is a relatively, it's considerably smaller vehicle, more in the midsize truck range. And some of that is in, enabled for sure by the aluminum body and some other decisions that they've made without their, with, through the rest of their chassis components itself, so. Yeah, I was actually, uh, at, a, at a high level, I was just pleased to see from a cost avoidance perspective um, that not a lot was changed in the body, right? It's saving Ford uh, a ton of money, which hopefully translates to a lower cost to the customer by not having to retool and redo all of these things, which from a capital investment perspective uh, is a immense expense to the OEM. And so uh, kudos to Ford for keeping things very, very similar and really monitoring and controlling where and how they spend those, uh, those investment dollars um, to ensure that you know, they're being efficient, not just with the design, but the cost, right? And that's something that they're all struggling with right now is bringing the EVs to market and keeping the cost low for everyone. So. Sure. Uh, is there anything else you kind of wanted to say about the, the body and weight? No, I, th I think that pretty much wraps it up. Yeah. So uh, thank you again for watching. We really appreciate it. And uh, that's all from us. Thanks. Thanks.